Greetings friends, welcome to Sovereign Grace Doctrine. We continue to look at the history of this New Testament church age and for the Word of God. And it will still be another 700 or so years before we really get into the deep part of that part where it deals with the Word of God. We're over there in our study at our church. But we're in the year 787. That history of this church age and the competition between that group known as Catholicism and those other groups who they called Anabaptists and whom the Reformers called Anabaptists of whom history calls them Anabaptists and also history connects the Baptists to the Anabaptists. That is our lineage. That is truly where the Baptists came from and we'll show you that eventually in this study also. 787 AD, one of the errors, false doctrines introduced by Catholicism was the Ava Maria prayer, the Hail Mary prayer, praying to Mary. Because they had exalted her to position as being the mother of God, they had decreed her to be the eternal virgin. But nowhere in Scripture are we commanded to pray to anyone but God Himself. What do the Scriptures teach us? Matthew chapter 6, and starting in verse 5, we read, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you that they have their reward. But thou... When thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to who? Pray to the Father, which is in secret. And thy Father, which, it, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Now, he's not talking about some man in a box on the other side of a wall from you. He's talking about God who is above. We're to call no man Father. That's another sinful tradition of ours. But only God the Father is the one whom we're commanded to pray unto. Christ said, pray unto the Father. He goes on to say, but when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask. Now tell me, is there any man that knows what you have need of before you pray? Certainly not. But God does. God knows what we have need of before we pray. And God, in His Word, God teaches us how we're to pray and who we're to pray for and, how we're, and what kind of condition we're to be in even when we pray. And he says, After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if ye forget, for if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, my friend, it has not been that long ago that we spoke in our Sunday messages on this very thought of when you pray. And my friends, if you haven't listened to those, I would recommend you listen to them to the more the fullness of prayer. But we'll continue to speak of these things here, and as these things they say, we're not to be like the heathen. But Catholicism in so many ways models its worship after the heathen method of worship. Praying over and over the same words, over and over saying the same things, that's vain repetition, which God says we're not to do. We're not to pray unto anyone but to God. Not to any of the saints, but to God. Not to the angels, 
but to God. Our Heavenly Father is the one who forgives us and saves us. And it is our Heavenly Father whom we're to pray to, not to any other being, not to any other human being even. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 and 44 tell us, it says, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. He doesn't tell us here to go out and to those who oppose us doctrinally, to hunt them down, to deprive them of their property, their freedom, and their very life. The Catholicism has done this great evil, and they're still doing much of this in third world countries. Persecuting those who do not agree with them doctrinally, restricting them, even threatening their own people. Oh, if you leave us, we'll go over and talk to the person you work for, and we'll get them to fire you. My friends, this is documented that they do this kind of stuff in third world countries where they have the power. And they call themselves religious people. They, they profess to be serving the true and living God. Know the truth and it will set you free. Come out of them, lest you be held accountable for their sins. Matthew chapter 9, starting at verse 37. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. These are how we're to pray. This is what the, God, the Word of God tells us, how we're to pray and what we're to pray for. We're to pray that God send forth people to take that gospel of this lost and dying world and to be witnesses before all men of the grace of God. We're not to go forth with violence, threats of violence against the people of this world, but we're to preach the counsel of God unto them and pray God open their eyes. Oh, such great evil that has been done in the world by men of religious natures. Romans 8, 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. My friends, at times we don't know what we ought to pray for, how we ought to pray for a situation. We see people that are because of uh, infirmities upon them, because of sicknesses, diseases, natural age, and the affliction upon their body and upon their mind. And we pray God have mercy upon them. We pray God heal them. But we don't truly know what God's will is for them. We don't know truly what they need in their life, but God does. So even when we at times are lifting up prayers before God and we really don't know how to pray as we ought and we don't know how to pray for certain matters as we ought to, yet that Holy Spirit of God is interceding for us with groanings which cannot be uttered, communicating between us and God of the true circumstances of our life and how that we, each of us personally, need to be strengthened and edified and be closer to the center of God's will for ourselves and for all those around about us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 10, first 17, 517 tells us to pray without ceasing. We should always have a spirit of prayer. We're to pray to God. We're to go have that personal, private time of prayer when we can be by ourselves. No matter what time of day it is, it could be many times of the day. It could be a room somewhere in your house. It could be in your car. It could be anywhere. Out in the woods. Under a tree. Or out in the field. Have that personal, private time between you and God praying and you seeking God's will in your life. Desiring God to conform you to the image of His Son. And with all the things which we're commanded to pray for, honoring God in our prayer, not coming before Him presumptuously or dishonorably and mocking God, but we're to honor God, and when we pray unto Him and to know and understand that He is God, 
the creator of all things and the judge of all. And lest God have mercy upon people, they shall die and go to hell. And we should pray God's will be done in this life, in this earth, even as his will is done in heaven. And indeed it will be. And, we are, and that in praying for it, we're also centering ourselves, we're striving to, seeking to center ourselves, center our will with his will, or to align our will with his will so that we are being used according to his will in this life, and that it be our heart's desire for the will of God to be done in our life and in the lives of all those around about us. 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 1, it says, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For all, we could say all mankind here, in truth, in a sense. That we give supplications for all mankind. For all those we know, especially around about us. Family, friends, neighbors, people we work with, even when we see something happening along the way as we travel. Maybe it's an accident. Maybe someone's been pulled over. Praying for them and the officers and the other agencies that may be involved. And always having a attitude of prayer, praying, we are praying in those private occasions and praying publicly for the glory of God and not to be seen of men. All oh, some think, well, because he tells us not to pray in the synagogue, stand in the corner, not to pray in the corner of the street, that uh, public prayer is condemned. No. We, they did pray in public. We know that. But having the right spirit in public prayer is just as important as having the right spirit in your private prayer time. Not a long, lengthy prayer with uh, such a fabulous discourse that it's just all beautiful. Beautiful. Oh, he prayed for an hour. Oh, it was beautiful. No, those sweet short prayers are the, to the point that magnify God and put us in our place as his humble servants of God and exalts God as the true God of all creation and honoring his Son and praying God's will be done in our life in all matters and all things that we be conformed to the image of his Son in all things. Praying and desiring of God for all giving prayers and supplications and praying for intercessions in the lives of all, that all men might come to the truth, that all men might live peaceably together, honoring and glorifying God, and not striving with one another in conflicts of war and violence against one another, and giving thanks unto God for all of them, giving thanks unto God for our pastors, and those that would teach unto us the Word of God. Giving thanks unto God for those elder men and women in our churches who are living godly examples and have lived godly examples before us in word and deed. Praying and giving thanks unto God for those in our local communities who are leading rightly and setting the right examples before the people. Those that are over us, if we, uh, if we serve godly people, if we work for godly people, then we ought to give thanks for them lifting them up before God, praying God be with them and bless them. We ought to give thanks for those in our local agencies, those men and women that are godly men and women that are out there in law enforcement and they're in our uh, levels of government from the local city to the state to the federal, to those who will stand up and declare the word of God and say this is right and that is wrong. That's what's wrong in our day and time. We don't have the kind of men and women we need to have leading a nation like this. We have ungodly men and women who want to justify all manner of, un of ungodliness and wickedness, who want to turn from common sense knowledge and understanding of life and all things and to deny what has been commonly understood and known for thousands of years that there are but men and women and nothing else. Oh, I want to say to you, my friends, we ought to be praying for the young children of our nation, for they are in such harm's way today like they have not been since I don't know when. Ungodly men and women in this nation that want to pleasure in their own wickedness to the point that they're willing to put children in danger. 
They're willing to force upon children knowledge of sexuality and to, con to, and to begin to convince children that they could choose whether they're a boy or a girl. Such absurdness. Such wickedness. My friends, we have a responsibility to pray for those in authority over us and pray that God might bring our nation back under a condition where we sovereignly understand and serve God and that the wicked and the ungodly would be cast down or be saved. But that God might save us from this wicked and untrod generation. May God help us to understand that great responsibility we have in prayer to lift up all before him. To pray for the rulers, to pray for kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. The Bible tells us that exercise profiteth little. But godliness and honesty profiteth much. God, God, it's godliness and contentment, sorry. The godliness and con with contentment profiteth much. That's what we need as a people. We need to live godly and we need to be content with such things as we have that we might have a better life and that God might bless our nation and turn us from our wickedness. And that it might unify us in those things. But wicked and ungodly people want to divide us and destroy us and bring us down because they hate God. And they hate the principles of which this country was founded upon. And don't let anybody tell you that that's not true. For we were founded upon godly principles. We were founded as a Christian nation. And don't let anybody tell you it was not so. For that early Congress that we had, they commissioned the printing of a King James Bible. Oh, that's the kind of knowledge they don't want to tell you today. They don't want to acknowledge what that first Congress did. They wanted this to be a Christian nation. They didn't want this to be a nation under the thumb of, uh, under the thumb of Catholicism. But they wanted this to be a free Christian nation where men were free, men and women were free to worship the God of heaven in truth and in spirit. But wicked and ungodly men and women have come along and they've covered up, they've put away the past, they've put away the truth, they've put away true history that you might not know it. All oh, so much things that are not taught to our people. Verse 3, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. This is what's good and acceptable. But we pray unto God that we seek His will in our lives and not our own. And that we pray for all. All my friends, we need to examine ourselves, make sure our hearts are right, and that we've forgiven our debtors, that we've forgiven those who trespass against us. Make sure that we have asked God to have mercy upon us for all of our sins and wickedness. God will help us to flee from it. Such a great responsibility to lift up one another and all before God in prayer, even our enemies. We move on. And in the year 789 A.D., we read of Charles the Great. He issued the first law in Europe for baptizing infants. His imperial majesty proposed to the whole nation the dreadful alternative, either being assassinated by the troops or accepting life on condition of professing themselves Christians by being baptized and the severe laws yet stand in the capitularies of this monarch. In other words, it's still on the books by which they were obliged on pain of death to be baptized themselves and of heavy fines to baptize their children within the year of their birth. These people with Francis and 
Hans were <coughs> constrained to embrace the Christian religion, it was up to the clergy to enforce this. And you can see, and we've seen, and we'll see in history to where the church, as it were, as they call it even yet today, which is Catholicism, that's what they speak of when they speak of the church, it's Catholicism. But Catholicism turned it back on them and said, no, we've got your souls in our hands. And we can excommunicate you, we can condemn you to purgatory. No, you're going to be the ones enforcing it, not us. And this they did. They turned it upon the princes, upon the rulers, and demanded of them, you go forth and you hunt them down and you bring them to us. Yeah, then, then we'll torture them, then we'll interrogate them, then we will try and convict those people and condemn them and put them to death. And that they did, by the means. All because of false doctrine of original sin, and original, and it's not just original sin in a sense, it's original condemnation. That because Adam sinned, you have the guilt of his sin. And that's not taught in the Word of God at all. We are not responsible for the sin of Adam nor any of our forefathers. We do not stand guilty for their sins. Nor will our children stand guilty for our sins and our failures. So don't you know the Bible says that your sins carried on to third and fourth generation? Yeah, the burden of it, that is, they're gonna be they're gonna fall on our footsteps. And if we do such a wicked thing, it will be in our children's lives also. They too will be desirous of doing the same things we do. But they're not accountable for what we do. And we're not accountable for what they do. Scriptures teach that plainly. We are all accountable unto God for our own specific sins which each of us commit in transgressing the law of God and the laws of men that do not conduct that do not contradict the Word of God. When they tell you you're not to assemble yourselves together, as the manner of some is not to assemble themselves together, we're to say unto them we are to obey God rather than men. And we're to come together wherever we have to. Even if we have to go out here in the woods somewhere and meet in secret to get away from the law, as they did during the Dark Ages and even before and after. No, no law, no government has the right to say unto the people of God, you can't come together. Oh yeah, it's for your health and safety. No, don't do it. They have not the right. If it's God's will for us to get sick and die, then praise God. Even so, come Lord Jesus. They don't have the right. And we shall stand and vehemently oppose them and we all should, that are Christians and believers, we should stand up and say to the world governments, no, we will not comply. We will not cease to assemble. We will not cease to preach in the name of the Lord Jesus. The only true and only true way of salvation. And no, we will not baptize those who cannot profess faith in the Lord. For that is the baptism we see in scriptures, is believers' baptism. And that is immersion in water when they do come forth and take part in it. We move on to the ninth century and in the ninth century we consider once again in this century as we have in all those preceding lists from the book Martyr's Mirror the history of the faith the history of those who stood and opposed Catholicism the history of those who came out of Catholicism and decreed her to be the church of the Antichrist and that they decreed the Pope himself to be the Antichrist, and he is. These who stood for believers' baptism, who believed in the ordinances of the churches as just examples, not sacraments. There are no sacraments in the Word of God. You're saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and it is His shed blood that has cleansed you from all your sins. And there's no need for any more cleansing. 
no, there's no sin stains left. There's nothing there that God sees. It's just men. It's men that are teaching these heresies. So what do we find here? In that ninth century, in the year 812 A.D., the historian P.J. Twisk writes, Disputes began to arise in the Roman church. Well, imagine that. That great harmony of people that Constantine brought together and everything was just hunky-dory. No, it wasn't. It never was, and it's still not today. It is not the church of the Lord. That's one thing people need to get straight in their hearts and minds. Understand that. That Catholicism is not the church of the Lord. But disputes began to arise in this Roman Catholicism, this Roman church, concerning, concerning transubstantiation or the changing of the bread and wine and, and sacrament so that the custom of the Holy Supper was converted into idolatry. Teaching that it literally became the flesh and blood, transgressing the law of God, when the law of God tells us that it is a sin to drink blood, and if Christ transformed that wine into blood, he sinned, and so did every one of these apostles. They broke the law of God if they did that. So by that alone, we know that it's heresy, and it didn't happen. But by doing this, it leads to them worshiping, giving adoration unto that bread and that wine, as though it is the literal presence of Christ. Idolatry. Worshiping the things that are not God. In A.D. 814, let me say this as I'm thinking about this here. We have these out here that have changed the dating system. They no longer want to use B.C. for before Christ. And A.D., which is from the Latin, which means, uh, I'm forgetting not exactly what it means. But it too glorifies God. Common error and before the common error. These God-haters. These who don't want to believe in God don't want to use these distinguishing marks of B.C. and A.D. Don't fall into that trap. Don't do it. If you're a believer, refuse to use those designations. But speak of the B.C., the before Christ time period. Speak of the A.D., this time in which speaks of the time of after Christ's coming. But in A.D. 814, in the days of Louis the Pious, or, uh, there lived and wrote the celebrated Hamio, of whom various praiseworthy things concerning baptism upon faith are still in existence. His writings, speaking of people who were baptized upon profession of faith and not before, and of the belief of the churches those local independent churches who were called by the names of their leaders because that's what the Word of God tells us to follow our pastors as they follow God. Now my friends, we're running out of time but we'll pick this back up next week from the history of the faith this age of the churches. May God bless you and may God bless his word and keep you. May God keep you until we meet again.